Good morning. We're, we're going to finish the Sikha of the Rebbe from 1991, about the giving of the Torah, the different levels of the Torah that we are gifted and receiving from Hashem. And we're in the final, final part of the Sikha, paragraph 14. So this is over here, the last, the last words of the previous point was how we bring Hashem, reveal Hashem, that's our job. Hashem created the world incomplete because he left us a little bit of work to do, a little bit of something to reveal Hashem into this world. That's our part of creation. And uh, that's the, the concept that we've been learning that we bring draw Hashem, the Aleph represents Hashem, the master of the world, the Alufa of the world, the Alufa of the world, master of the world, into the Gola, into the exile, we make it Geula. That's our part, which we were created for. We weren't just created just without a purpose. We are created with a purpose to reveal Hashem in this world. And that's why the world needs us, and Hashem needs us, so to speak. We are here to fulfill the revelation of godliness in this world, and that's Geula. So that was the, the that we do through Torah, obviously. And that's our gift. So we're given the tools, we're given the soul, we're given the power, we're given everything to do it, and we're given the free choice to choose how much we want to reveal Hashem at every moment in this world. So paragraph 14. The Rebbe is connecting these ideas with an instruction that we can do practically now in our times. Number one, to make gatherings every Shabbos. To gather together every Shabbos and learn in, in the multitudes, learn in groups, learn together with other people. Including doing it in many people together. So we're saying this, we should do this every Shabbos service, especially now before Matan Torah to get prepared for the receiving the Torah, then how much more so the Shabbos before the giving of the Torah. Two. Also, next thing is to remind people to come to Shul to hear the Ten Commandments on Shavuot. It's, it's always, it always surprised me, I remember, since I came to America as a shlucha, how people don't, many, many Jews don't even know that the, the Shavuos exists, that there's a, a festival of the giving of the Torah. And, you know, everybody knows about Hanukkah, they know about Passover, but many Jews don't know about Shavuos, that we got the Torah. That always, like, amazed me. So hopefully it's not like that anymore. The says, it's, it's the it's the holiday where rabbis get to go on vacation. Oh my gosh! So it is. It's the Rebbe says we need to make um and remind people to come to shul to hear the Ten Commandments. It's very important, especially the also and also all the Jewish children, even the Rebbe says babies, infants in their cribs. Okay, that are you know come in the in the baby in the baby strollers. Because the children, the babies, all the kids were our guarantors to, to receive the Torah, right? We all know the Medrash that to in order we guaranteed that how are we going to keep the Torah? Because we're going to teach it to our children. All this is by emphasizing the two extremes of what we learned before we in order to receive the Torah. We need to have two extremes. One is to be nullified before Shem, like we're like like the rabbis say, dust before those in front of me. Like we we're okay being you know nothing because we recognize it's all Hashem. So that's the first stage. But at the same time that we can feel this nothingness and feel it's all Hashem, still have that great feeling of pride and gavhut and elation and a, a heightened awareness of the magnitude of who and what we are up to a point that we can make chidushim and make new insights, novel insights, our own insights, okay, which take a, a great self-esteem, a great recognition of our own powers to reveal Hashem and to make our, our own understandings chidushim and Torah, like we learned before, but that's why 
Hashem created the world. <clears throat> he could have created the world with one uh, statement, but he created it with 10, because there's the concept of Hashem creating the world with oneness and Hashem creating the world with 10, which is multitude. Multiple, multiplication of different details and both of them are significant and both of them we need to have and both of them we do have and could have more and more simultaneously as we come to Gula that we can have both extreme opposites of feeling completely humble and aware that it's all Hashem and at the same time be able to um, and innovate our Torah insights that we learned this yesterday the day before okay so you can go back to the recordings um, and back to the Sikha. Machad Gisa, together, have them simultaneously and fully we'll have it simultaneously this, this sense when Mashiach comes. So we'll have both together. So when we're, we can have this feeling of bitul, of nullification, when we have many, many people coming together, Nakil Kilos, right? We come together in multitudes together. So you feel uh, this oneness and you feel a little bit bitul. It's not just about me. There's like many people here, we're all, and we're all one, we're all bitl, we're all, as we're, we're, when we have bitl, we can all be together as one. Especially, we can feel this oneness of all men, women, and children together as one when we hear the Ten Commandments, right? Everybody's silent, everybody's listening, and we feel like one entity, we're one Jewish people. But what's also special when we're hearing the Ten Commandments, we're not um, getting together just with people that are on our own level. We're not just in a, a sheer for elite people who can understand it. No, we're all there together, men, women, and children. Um, and we're all in the same playing field of receiving the Torah. Even children and babies. Everybody together is coming to shul. This is the, the heightened level of bitl, of nullification. And at the same time, together with the bitl, of gathering together of a few people, of the Jewish people, together with this bitl, this nullification, this feeling of it's all about Hashem and we're all one, we're all one unit, same unit, we're all on the same playing field, right? We're all receiving the Torah, at the same time, we can feel our own existence of each every Jewish person, like when we're counted, each one, each one is receiving the Torah. I'm receiving the Torah. I'm learning the Torah. I'm acquiring and understanding it. With my own awareness, my own understanding. Until a point where I can make my own insights in Torah. Each person according to their capacity. Okay? That's paragraph 14. Paragraph 15. Does anybody want to say or ask something about this idea? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is a footnote here. Everyone is required to write a Torah. They have to write their own Torah of their own life and their own revelation and their own 42. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you for and me back to the screen. We are supposed to acquire Torah each person to our own right in our own way of understanding we are supposed to put the effort to make it meaningful and relevant to each of us and welcome e and i think that's sivia khana sivia khaya yes okay so the footnote 131 there that was bringing from a gemar brachas and i remember learning this with you ladies rabban gamilo used to say and he would announce Every it was a, he was the leader of that of that time during the second temple. He's or doing that right around the second temple or the end of the second temple or the right around the destruction. I think it's maybe right after the destruction. Anyway, he Rebelazar ben Azaria. I think we see him in the Haggadah. Okay, he said he when he was Nasi, when he was the, the leader, he said. Um, Nobody can come into my basement, this place of learning, to learn to, unless your inside and your outside are matching. Like tocha kavo, right? You're 100%. On, uh, they have to be on a certain level, okay? But after, um, 
after he, he stopped being the Nasi and Rebbe Lazar ben Azariah became the Nasi, the leader, he took away all the guards from the base medrash and he gave permission to anybody who wanted to come in to come in. And it says they, at that day, they added many, many benches to the place of learning, about 400 or 700, there's different opinions. And then, um, He, he was actually shown in they were shown him in his dream um kadimar like not basis um how do you say kadim um katkatan uh, vessels that were white that were full of, of dust meaning that not everybody was worthy of really coming in there they weren't full of the of tar they, i guess they were full of something else um still so his, he became a little weakened in his mind, meaning he felt a little bad about it. Um, wait, this is Aramaic. I'm sorry, I'm trying to translate from Aramaic this footnote. Um, uh, okay. Oh, the um, okay. The point was was actually they showed him something that made him feel a little bit better. Okay, it's I'm sorry, it's Aramaic, but the 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 point was is that he shouldn't feel so bad that people weren't on the level of understanding and they were joining the learning anyway. Um, they they shagam shemitzad that's why I mean because the point was when they showed him that something were that they in a way that they were worthy the, the rabbi is saying they didn't show him God forbid something not correct or something that's that's false even though they weren't worthy that he was shown that they were worthy in his dream okay the point was is that on their own they weren't worthy however once they came into the base medrash the rabbi concludes they became worthy. So, so there was some sort of a dream. I don't know exactly how it manifested in the dream with the with the with the with the jugs that were filled with with white dust. The point, well, the point is, what I was saying, is that in the dream he was reassured that it's okay what he did, and even though they weren't worthy, and the dream was true, meaning it wasn't a falsehood. That they, even so, that meaning that even though they weren't worthy, by coming to the synagogue to learn with the with Rabbi Lazar ben Isaiah, they became worthy. So that was a footnote to show that um, what we were saying is that... I think that's a very important footnote that should be shared with everyone who doesn't feel like they necessarily feel worthy to come to shul. I think it needs to be publicized. Yes, yes, it's very, very important. So that's the Rebbe's point. Everybody should come to shul, everybody, even the little babies. Uh, Torah belongs, there's a level of Torah that's inherited to each and one of us and it belongs to every one of us. Uh, how we receive it, each person is different, but there, but by coming to the shul, by coming to hear Torah, we become worthy of receiving it on different, on the higher higher levels. Of this is very gewalt. This is just really... Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, good. I'm glad it spoke to you. You want to hear okay. a story? Oh, you want to hear a story about that? Yes. Okay, so there was a man, and I forgot what city he was in, but he was in a coffee shop with his wife, a Jewish man, and she's Oriental. And so he was called for a minion at the local Chabad. They went into the coffee house and saw him and called him for a minion. And he came. And mm -hmm. he, um, he, they treated him so nicely there mm -hmm. that he divorced his wife, married wow. a Jewish woman, and had children. And by the way, this is the miracle of it. He came to our shul. I didn't know if this was, a, you know, I'm sure it wasn't made up, but he came to our shul and he told this story. And that's what happened. And why? He said, why did he do that? He said, because I felt I was so unworthy and they proved that I was worthy to be in a minion. And wow. I Worthy to be in a minion, I shouldn't be living the life I'm living. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> Maybe that's why they need a minion, <laughs> just, so that, <laughs> just so that he would come to show. Um, but it reminds me, when I, when I was younger, um, 
I, we used to be Rabbi Robertson in the shul by the beach for just for Shabbos. We'd go there every Shabbos, slept there, and go home during the week. So they, it was a, sh- a small shul that barely had a minion. And sometimes they'd have to go to the corner, whatever. To There was a, a man who had an office building nearby. And they used to ask him to come, he was a Sephardi man. And so he would be nice and come to, to Minyan on Shabbos to help out. That person ended up becoming very observant and also um, having a big influence and a very big inspiration. He's frequently asked to be a guest speaker. He was one of the guest speakers at the Chabad uh, convention wow. or whatever for Shluchim. And he's, whenever there's a big event, like where they needed like a good MC or something, he's called upon. So anyway, so that was started in our little shul that didn't have a minion every Shabbos. <laughs> they needed to go and ask him to please come help out. So that's, um, okay, so everything with a purpose. Okay, let's go on uh, 15. V'hiratzon, the Rebbe is um, making a prayer over here, a, a quest from Hashem, it should be Hashem's will. V'hu and this is the main thing. Sh'achlata lo hosif b'achlatam sh'yisov, our hachlata, our resolution, a decision to add in the, uniting the Jewish people in order to prepare ourselves to receive the Torah, like the Jews had, in order to receive the Torah, they had to hate argumentation and to love peace. They should immediately cause the nullification, the vital of the exile. The reason for the exile, Galus, is the opposite of loving our fellows. When the, when the cause and the reason for this division is battle, is nullified, and, and, and immediately, as a result, will be the cause of it will also, meaning the the, misuva, the result of it will also be butter. So if the cause is gone, which was the opposite of Abisoso, then the result of the gullus will also be butter gone. And so immediately we'll have a true and complete redemption through Mashiach. This will be the revelation of Torah Hadasha Maitza, the full Torah will be fully revealed, manifest with all its inner dimension, all its reasoning, all its understanding on the deepest levels. That will be in times of Mashiach, when a new Torah will come from me, the, the deepest, deepest um, parts of Torah will be revealed. That before we even receive Torah, before the Rosh Chodesh Sivan, um, of the month of Sivan, Shabbat Barashat Beha Bechukosai, and that year, the Beha Bechukosai was the Mevarachim, Shabbos Mevarachim. It's not this this year. Now, Zochim Lakim Ayud Vasipu Shabbat Chalat Barashat Beha. We we should have this promise and the and the story that's told to us in the beginning of the Parashat Beha. Ki Tavo Al Arts that you should come when you will come to the land. And also the beginning of Pashat Bukhukutai says, when it not see blood, the land will give its produce. The trees of the field will give their fruit. It says in the future, the land of Israel will bring up out different types of be- um, wonderful pastries and uh, baked goods, meshi, clay meshi, and, and beautiful ve- vessels. And trees that don't haven't been giving fruits will bear fruits in the future, it says. So um 137, so you can look uh, in Rashi on the on this verse. There's the footnote, you can look it up. Then we come to the book where we're counted, but midbar. The counting of all the Jewish people, each and every Jew, like it says, like it says in the future, Hashem will gather each and every Jew. And together, Hashem is gathering us all, each one and all, right? All Jews will be gathered 
and will come to together to be one unit. Like it says, Kahal Gadol, a, a multitude, a, a big um, congregation. Kahal is like a congregation, so a big in gathering. And together we'll have the tenth counting of the Jewish people. It says we're counted nine times. Mashiach times we will be counted one more time, tenth time. Together we'll have the tenth song. Like we said, there were ten, nine songs the Jewish people sang throughout the generations to thank Hashem. Like one of them was the song of Moshe Vena after the, the, the ocean split, right? Shir Sayam, the famous, famous one. The tenth one will be in times of Geula, okay? The tenth, the tenth red heifer will also take place. Asiriya Kodesh will be in times of Geula. Through this will be revealed through the king through the king Mashiach. We'll see immediately that really Mashiach is already amongst us. Each person can point with his finger and say, "He said this is Mashiach." Amalech Mashiach, who kvarba and he already came. You know, it's very interesting because the, um, the power of, of visualization is also very, very, we have one more paragraph, very strong. I saw that when I was in 770 for Pesach. So in 770, like I was there for the Sudas Mashiach, the first time in my life. The, the, I had been to 770 many times, especially when I was a teenager and I get to see the Rebbe and I used to have the Rebbe. I used to imagine the Rebbe was actually looking at me because it looked like it. if you stood you know, in the ladies' shul opposite the Rebbe, it, it, the Rebbe would look ahead. It was always seemed like the Rebbe was looking directly at me. And I'm sure a lot of people felt that way also, because the Rebbe would look in the direction and it would seem like the Rebbe is just staring at you. So in any event, um, it was, I remember it was like a hard thing to like, you want to look at the Rebbe and you want to dive in, you know? So there's always that debate we would talk about, like, where do you look at your sitter or do you look at the Rebbe when he's dive in? So that was like something that we had, we had to deal with when I was a teenager. And um, so now when I was there for the first time, on um, um, the, you know, the last day of Pesach for the Sudas Mashiach, they have a big crowd coming in and like everybody comes and they sing Nigunim, they sing a lot of beautiful, you know, for hours. They sing for hours and hours and people, people bring their mats on their wine and it's a nice uh, for bringing. People bring their kids. So um, but they set it up exactly the same way as there ever was, you know, in a physical body you know, what we could see the Rebbe with our physical eyes. But what I noticed is there were quite a few people. And one of them was my husband's Mechutan. He's an older man and he stands there, he was standing there like with the young people looking at the Rebbe's direction. He's from France. He's very simple, holy, sweet Jew. And he was looking at the Rebbe for like three hours, just standing in that one place, looking in the direction of the Rebbe's chair. I would not be able to do that myself. <laughs> it takes a lot of... Uh, a lot of focus. So here he was visualizing the Rebbe for three hours or more. Who knows how long he was there. He, he could have been there before I arrived. And, um, and focused on in, in visualizing the Rebbe in his chair in 770. That was, it was like, for me, that was a big lesson in the capacity to release, tune ourselves into the Rebbe and be focused. And um, and it's possible, it's possible for us to, to really, like the Rebbe said, uh, be over here, to be able to say, look, here's, here's Mashiach, Mashiach's here, he's already amongst us, and um, Mashiach, like I said, the Rebbe says, Melech Mashiach should be revealed, and we should be able to be able to say, yes, here, here's Mashiach. Then we come to the time of the giving of our Torah, completely, completely holy Torah, fully revealed, our holy land, the holy city, the the holy mountain, the of the Kodesh and the in the base of Mikdash and the holy temple, in the holy of holies, We have the in it, we have the Aaron with the tablets, right? The tablets were engraved, the chukosai, otios chatika, engraved letters on the tablets. We have them. They're right now they're under they're on 
I'm doing, I'm hired by some Temple Mount and it's hidden in a tunnel. Torah Hadashah Mitzitz says, and the Torah, a new Torah will come out from Hashem. The Torah shall Mashiach, the Torah Mashiach, she will meditate Kol Am, he will teach the whole nation. Ad Shalimut Makadosh Baruch Hu Bechvodo Ma'atzmato will have the learning from Hashem Himself. Mi'iti Mamash from Hashem Himself Mamash. Kamasha Kadov Lo Yomadu Ad Ishu Torah. It's like it says we want to be teaching each other Torah. Why Kulam Yidoti? We'll all know Hashem. We'll be within, within, from within our own sense of our neshama and our body will be knowing Hashem. We will be able to see our teacher, we'll be able to see Hashem teaching us. Immediately, mamash. So that is just, and the footnote 147 says, like it was already at the time of the giving of the Torah, we were all saw a relation of Hashem a high level, except like it's explained in Tanya chapter 36. Just then, we weren't on the level to be able to handle it, souls and bodies, but in terms of Mashiach, we'll be able to understand and receive the Torah and see the sing Hashem, welcome and Nasa, in a way that we won't expire, we won't leave our bodies, we'll be, you know, we'll, we'll have work, because the Rebbe explains this another place, because of all these years of exile and going through all the trials and tribulations and, and the process of seeing Hashem in this gallus, in this exile, and connecting to Hashem constantly deeper and more, even though we've, we're seeing, experiencing such pain and tragedies, we've been connecting and seeing Hashem through it all throughout the many years of exile. That makes us have the capacity to be able to see Hashem in the true and complete Gula and revealed in the highest form without leaving our bodies. Our bodies will be so refined and so attuned to Hashem, no matter what, that we'll be able to withstand such revelations within a body. Not only that, our body will be tuning into Hashem and helping us. It's in the, at a certain point, it says our body will be nurturing our soul. Our body will be giving us these revelations and helping us see and sense Hashem more. We'll feel Hashem in our bones and our kishka, right? We'll sense Hashem in our, with our intuition, with our inner knowing, with our, in our physical body, we'll be able to you know, sense where we need, where we need to go, where Hashem is revealed, where in inside of us, right? It won't be we're detached and we're trying to connect. We'll be already on this level of inner connection with Hashem. So that's we're sensing, beginning to sense that now with with Chassidus, and more and more tuning into Hashem, and so fully, fully with Gilu Shlema. So that's the sicha b'havachu kasei. Welcome, Karen. Also. Yes, so anybody want to say something, ask something? We completed the sikha. I could check if there's any more footnotes. But... Yeah, there's a footnote 143. That's an important footnote about, okay, the Rebbe puts in the footnote, when in the, the tabernacle that we will Un unveil from underneath the, the temple mount where the, it's hidden in a tunnel, right? The iron and the luchos. There's also the broken luchos, not just the second set of luchos that were complete, but also the first set that were broken are also there. And that teaches us about shuva, about having a broken heart, that Mashiach will come also to return the tzaddikim in shuva, meaning the, the shuva is not just for people who sinned or erred, but also for people who are holy and righteous, meaning this level, there's a level of tshuva that we all can return and connect to Hashem, even the highest people and the highest people who are called tzaddikim. Okay, so that's another thing. Um, see if there's any more footnotes. And if you want to say something, ask something, go ahead. Um, okay. I just want to. I just yes. want to thank you, Yehudas, for the for the recordings when I oh. I've not been able to get on, but Baruch Hashem, okay. I've been okay. able to access the recordings, and I appreciate it a okay, lot. Good, good, good. Yes, also you could go on Facebook, and it usually goes on Facebook too. Thank you, and that's good to see you. <laughs>
Thank you. Good job, job as everyone. Job. <laughs> I frequently think about you. Where is Edna Fox? She's somewhere wishing she could be in class and okay, just good. being called. <laughs> okay, good. Good for you. You should be much successful. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so this 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 sikha is very important because we all want to be able to internalize Torah and receive Torah on many, many levels. And this sikha gives us a little bit of a key and a clue of this, this, the, the, this, this, the two extremes that we need to have, that we could have to, in, in Torah simultaneously. One is having that feeling of sense of ah, Hashem, that it's all Hashem and we're nothing, that fits on that. That feeling of we're nothing that we all need to have, that is a, that we do need to have as a prelude to be able to receive the Torah. And that gives us the, the capacity also to receive the Torah in a very, very high, much higher level than the one that we just inherit and we, we all have no matter what, no matter who. So there's levels of Torah. So there's levels of Torah that we can we can receive once we make ourselves buckle, make ourselves stumble. But then once we ascend to that level of receiving the Torah because of our bittel, because that we're you know tuning into Hashem, then we can receive levels of Torah that are beyond the world outer worldly levels of Torah that are like, uh, you know, a gift, uh, uh, something that we need, you know, we need the bittle for a higher level than, the, than a normal person could with their own um, just brain, brain power learn. So it's, it's like, you know, we see this, people are trying to learn Torah around the world, non-Jews trying to learn Torah and Gemara and this and that because they they see it as a secret for success. I, I saw something, I don't know if you saw it, but in Japan, they, te they teach Gemara because they think that Jews are successful because they learn, you know, Torah and they learn Gemara. So they want to be successful. So that, Okay, so that's not the right, re I mean, I, I don't know how much help they're getting from learning Torah on that level. That's not the reason we learn Torah. If we want Torah to really uh, get to our, on the higher, higher levels of connection to Hashem and revelations of Torah beyond the world, which is really what, I, I think is causing us to be <laughs> so, uh, the wow factor, then we have to have the exact extreme opposite of bittel, of like a sensing this is really, it's all about Hashem and it's Hashem is one and everything. Hashem is creating us from nothing to something at every, no, that, that bittel of we're nothing and it's really all about Hashem, it's all Hashem. That is what the key to bring us to this higher level of, of understanding the awareness of Torah up to a point where we could be speaking and Hashem speaks through us and he reveals you know, Torah, and we're just, we're just a vehicle, okay, and then, you know, then we can come to also an, uh, an understanding and reveal our own insights in Torah, without the ego, it's a, it's a correct ego, it's a good ego, it's just, we're manifesting Hashem's teachings, and then we know Hashem wants us to understand it in our own way, but it's not me who's understanding. Hashem's putting these insights into me and these understandings, and then I'm, I'm relating to it. So it's it's Hashem. Hashem is revealing wonders, but we get that also only when we have the teachings of Chassidus. So with the teachings of Chassidus, we can be bato, we can be nullified, and sense it's all about Hashem, and yet still be aware of our existence. And our own understanding and our own insights, but it's not our own insights. It's like, look at me, who am I? I I'm, you know, I've got this, and you know, it, this superiority. No, it's all, it's the recognition, it's all Hashem manifesting these insights through us and wanting our, our wanting us to complete creation. Hashem wants us to fix and finalize and bring the wholeness to the world. He created it when we sense Hashem is creating us at every second. We, we relate and understand what are we here for? We're here for this purpose of understanding and seeing Hashem at every moment, seeing the, the Geula at every moment, seeing Hashem in every second, and seeing Hashem in every word of Torah, seeing Hashem in, in the Chassidus and the understand and the deeper dimensions. This is all revelations of Hashem through us. We see ourselves as Hashem speaking through us and we can come to our understanding in a way of holiness, of Kedusha, of revelations and manifesting Hashem with our purpose in creation is to reveal Hashem. So every time we reveal an insight of Torah, we're revealing Hashem on a new level in this world that wasn't revealed before. It's yay, okay? So when we're talking about revealing miracles, that's also the miracles of seeing Hashem in Torah 
and that we can get through learning Hasidus. We can really reveal these wonders of Hashem in the Torah. We can come to real insights and um, chidushim, but we need to we need to understand it from a perspective of understanding Hasidus. It's not just Torah as it is the revealed form; it's the inner dimensions of Torah, which is what's the inner dimensions? It's Hashem within the Torah. So when we see Torah as Hashem's Torah, Hashem within the Torah, we're connecting to Hashem in the Torah, then we can come to these deeper insights of the wonders of Torah. And that's because we learned Hasidus, we can come to that and we can reveal the wonders of Torah without, with a healthy ego, not with the high ego of like, uh, I'm this smart Talmud Chacham. <laughs> we're revealing, it's just doing our part to reveal Hashem through the capacity that he gave us and the job that he gave us to reveal him in this world. What did you want to say, Chavar Do you want to say something? No. <laughs> I don't. I'm just, I'm just um, moving. It just, this is moving. I guess it's moving me. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have lots of wonderful insights that you need to reveal. <laughs> it's just amazing. So it's just it's amazing. trying to like... come out from you. <laughs> I, I revealed something today on the um, on yeah. Arich of a, I mean it, it's uh, anyway so so that this morning before that's why I was late I was writing something to the You're writing something responses to yay good for you and thank you for sending me that article um, on the mezuzahs printed a base Mashiach yes. who, who wrote your mezuzah it's so important yeah I like the price thing I was shocked actually yeah prices have gone up and really, 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 if a surfer is really, really going to take his time, <laughs> it, it needs you know, like to be paid more because if you can't calculate it, um, how much time it takes to write a very, very beautiful holy mezuzah, then it's, you, you, it, you put it that way, you get what you pay for. It's a bargain. It's a too. What? It, yeah. Then it's a bargain. Yeah. If you calculate, it's, it's a bargain. I know in LA, there's, there's, I don't think there's um, anybody who's actually writing, aside from my husband, writing, uh, you know, writing. There are certain people, they'll do checking or they'll do, you know, maybe repairs or maybe, you know, they'll do other stuff, but they won't actually write because it doesn't pay enough for it to be worth their time. So mm -hmm. that's a shame. We need more, more certain to be willing to write because mm -hmm. there is a little bit of a shortage. Actually, last night, somebody called us yesterday. They want a, a nice pair of tefillin right away for bar somebody in the Russian shul is having a bar mitzvah on Sunday. Oh. And they want the nice big Chabad tefillin of four by fours. <laughs> they didn't say, they just said nice tefillin. So we had one pair of nice good tefillin that we actually, was, we were so ha happy we had for them, ready to go. And they said, no, 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 he wants the big size, the four by four um, centimeters. Latin. So that we don't have ready. You know, usually people order it ahead of time. It's a, it's a very expensive item. It's not something that necessarily just carry, you know, <laughs> invest and have. People usually want to pre-order that and custom made. They want to know, you know, who is the cipher and this and that. So we didn't have of the four by four. So he's he's the, the rabbi is trying to get him this nice big Chabad size tool and is like going a little nuts last night trying to call around the different uh, venues. I, I I don't think he found one yet. I don't know if he will find one by Sunday. It's um in LA, in the West Coast. It's a shame. Hopefully he will. My husband has the he bought that him to write fill in for it. So he has the four by four, just the cases that he bought in Israel, but he doesn't have the, the parchment. So that's okay. So that like I'm saying, it's 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 not what I'm saying is is that there's not enough. You know, they're expensive, you know, <laughs> there's not enough inventory of, of, um, of written material because it's, um, yeah, it's, exp it's expensive. It takes time, it takes effort. So it's not like, it, like anything else you click on Amazon and you can get it within 24 hours or a few hours. It's not, it doesn't work that way. With, it takes time. Anyway, so why did I get off a tangent on that? We were talking about the article and the expense and the time that it takes in there. Oh, because you said you're you're surprised how much it costs for a mezuzah. Yeah, yeah, it takes time. It takes time to write a good mezuzah. 
um, and people need to know this. There's a lot people need to know about mezuzahs to know how to dis how to dis how to um, see the value. A lot, not just the money is the value. It's the time, the care, the sofa, the you know yeah. everything. There's okay. a lot of loss, a lot of yeah, and also you have to take into account sometimes the sofa can write a mezuzah and mess up. And there's more strict laws in writing mezuzah than there are in like writing a Megillah. A Megillah, you can make a mistake, you can fix it. With the mezuzah, it has to be written in order, meaning it has to be written. Oh, like if you make simple. a mistake, you have to start over. Yeah, yeah. So that can happen, that happens. And a sofa could spend hours writing, and then the mezuzah is not, it's, it's gone. Oh. So it's to re restart. So it's it, so it's not just the time that it took him to write that mezuzah. It's that mezuzah plus the ones that he messed up. <laughs> that was an amazing story about the Megillah that what was missing was not bowed. <laughs> not yeah. bowed. Yeah, that, not is, bowed. That, that is actually a miracle. But think of it. There's a Megillah. If you look at the nourishment I posted, my husband, somebody gave him the Gabai Varashul gave him a, 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 something that was been inherited in his family, a hundred, approximately hundred year old Megillah. And he could see it from the, the parchment, how old it is and the style and everything. So he's, he, he went through a computer check so he could, you know, it scanned where the areas that there's errors possible that he needs to fix. And he had to go over it and see which one was really an error, which one wasn't. Um, the computer is not always exact <laughs> in any event. So, so the, there was one word missing, okay? The word that was missing this 100-year-old Megillah was the word and not, and he did not. So what was he did not? It was talk, that, that the story of Mordechai and Haman. So we know at the beginning of the Megillah, it says, Mordechai, Mordechai did not bow down and did not kneel over before Haman when he would pass by. We know the Midrashim, he did not show... Um, him the honor that he wanted. So therefore, the part in the Megillah over here that where it was the word did not was missing was where Haman gets really angry at, at Mordechai when he was already in this state of elation that Hashverish was inviting him to the party and this and that. And then as he's in this heightened state of elation of, uh, of his height of his career, so to speak, and height of his power, and he's going out from the, from the palace and he sees that Mordechai lo kandaloza did not get up and did not move. Okay, Lozaza is to move or to be to be moved, both like internally or and physically, right? So he wasn't, he wasn't, he was kind of like just standing still, like and ignoring him. And the word did not za did not move, wasn't wasn't moving or wasn't perturbed or wasn't you know shaken or anything. Za is to like be you know like uh, okay. Okay. startled. So um so Mordechai the, did not, the word did not was missing. So it means that this Megillah was always saying he did move or he was perturbed. So finally, okay, my husband erased, had to erase a few words and rewrite them to, to stick in the did not into there. There he is. And, and that now the, the, the Megillah is Kasha. Is, is, I mean, it, it, Megillah has much less problems. It could, it could have been kosher. Was it kosher? It was, it was still kosher with, without that word, because the Megillah can have, but I, I think on a spiritual level, it wasn't, it was a problematic, you know, they got the wrong message over there. So, so, so the mezuzah is fixed. Um, I mean, that mezuzah, Megillah. It's much easier to fix the Megillah. You can't do that with the mezuzah. You cannot go back and put it and, and erase and rewrite or add a, add a letter you know, that was missing in any event. So this, um, this, this story is significant. Why? Because I had Reblazer on as my teacher. He was the, what held him 20 years in Siberia was this teaching that the previous Rebbe told him. And he said, be like Mordechai Hayyudi, where it says about him wow. that, that he did not, he did not bow down. He didn't come, he didn't get up, he didn't get moved. He wasn't in the state of showing any fear. Okay, and it's not just that he um, uh, was this superhuman being that wasn't fearful. He was afraid, but he didn't show it. Okay, he didn't get up. He didn't move. He didn't bow down. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't show his fear. Because I asked the place, I asked him, "What? You weren't afraid?" He said, "Yes, I was afraid, <laughs> but I didn't show it." That was his um, motto, and that's what kept him going for twenty years 
in Siberia, that he had this blessing from the Rebbe that told him, if you will not show fear, you'll be like Mordechai who did before Haman, you'll make it out. And that's what kept him going, and that's what gave him strength, and that's what made him be able to keep Shabbos and, and kosher. And even though halakhli he was supposed to eat maybe non-kosher food, and it was he should have, Michal Shabbos would save his life, but he didn't take those calculations because he had the, the, the Rebbe's promise and he understood that if he will not be afraid, that meant keeping Shabbos, keeping kosher, keeping everything, keeping his beard and pace. That's the only way he'll make it through. And that's what kept him going. And it did. And he made it through. Yeah. Does everyone know about the book that he wrote? Sabota. And that, Sabota. Sabota? Yeah. It's such a, it's a really amazing. I mean, I, I can't, I still feel the book. It's been years since I read it. Yeah, yeah. The Rebbe told him to write the book. That's what he told me. And uh, when he brought it to the Rebbe, though, there was too much in there that was too hard for people to fathom. And the Rebbe told him to t take out some of the parts that were just a bit too much to bear. Wow. And being the kind of chassid that he is, he burned the parts of the book that he... Oh. And then afterwards, he said he regretted burning it. He should have oh. <laughs> at least kept it aside, not printed it, but not burnt it. But in any event, he was... Um, he was, uh, it was all with the Rebbe's blessing. So it's interesting because there's this debate now also, how much of this pain and suffering of the people do we expose to everybody, right? With the hostages and everything. And somebody posted this, the, the, there's a, a video of the hostage, the girls that was released a couple of days ago. And it's a very, very difficult um, video to watch. I know I had nightmares last night. And um, it's not, it's not necess necessarily if there's that debate. Do we show it? Do we not? On one hand, we want to show it because we want people to do something or daven for them. Or do, on the other hand, if it drags you down and it makes you, you know, have nightmares and it makes you sad and it takes you away from doing something, then that's also a problem. If it gives you trauma that you makes you stuck, so that's that's so that's interesting. You you reminded me of the story that they ever told him not to publish everything, okay? So that was the instruction. Don't tell everybody everything that you suffered because it'll be way too much. Well, there's sure a lot in there. And what he took out must have been really horrible. Yeah, what he did, but I guess it was enough for people to be able to read it and not have nightmares at night, okay? You know what's good, what I liked about it? I mean, besides yeah. everything. Yeah. What it's I like cool. is how, how people came to his side. The really, really bad guys, the real horrible guys yes, exactly. came to his side and helped him. Right. Right, so there was a point of showing how the transformation of the good things that he was able to accomplish also, that was the point of the book, to give people courage, to give people hope, that even in the most difficult things that he went through, he was strong and he was helped and assisted from unexpected ways. And he was able to even help other people while he was there who were in a, more despondent and more depressed than, than, than he was. So, but the, the, the goal is, is not to bring people to a plate of despair and, and, and God forbid sadness that stagnates, you know, trauma that you can't do anything or you're dragged down with negative feelings. The point of these stories and revealing this is to bring the inspiration, like the story of the, the stories of the, of the woman who came out that needs to be published, 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 how they, what they, you know, how they felt strong when they were there. How this the girl who was telling the story about how the, the she wasn't observant or anything, but before she was taken, she had this sense that she there's something bad is going to happen to her, and she um, googled and found a, a chapter of Tehillim, chapter 27, and she said it every day for 40 days, and then on 40th day she was taken um, hostage, and then she understood why she was saying this chapter because it was talking about being held by your enemy and not to fear. So that she said that she said that while she was there over and over it was her like mantra and it kept her strong and it, and she eventually was was released. So stories like that are what we need to hear about how people held strong and were were assisted with their faith and their strength. So that's to give people hope and courage to do something good about it, not to just feel despaired. So that's um, I'm just that's the balance I think of horrible and just enough. Yes, it's bringing the Aleph into the Gola, bringing the Hashem into the picture and seeing that really Hashem is behind it all and we can, we can hold on to 
our faith and hold on to our um, knowledge of Hashem and bring light into darkness. That's the goal. Send the story of, of your friend from Chicago who was released, yeah. who, who insisted on kosher food and insisted on, on being strong even when she was there. And she was the first one to be released. Right. And even Negovas, she said, I need water. They said, no. They, she said, it's right there. What's the problem? <laughs> so they got it. Right. I mean, just like that. It's right there. What's the problem? Right. She didn't become their victim. Yeah. Yeah. So we, with that, we can learn from that. Don't become a victim. Be strong in every, don't become overwhelmed with their, with their, their fear mongering. And their tactics of feeling that they have power over you or trying to make you believe that they have power over you. It's only Hashem has ultimate power. And they sense that. She's a devout right. woman who believes that Hashem is with her to the point that she's observing. They realize that they don't have power over her. She's not right. there. And they don't need her there. They, they, want they don't her. need her there. Right. She said, she said, I need kosher food. I'm Jewish. It's mm -hmm. like that she said. I mean, in the way she said it, it was just so cool. I'm Jewish. I need kosher food. What are you thinking? What are you thinking putting me here without Jewish food and without kosher food? <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, that was, I wonder if she knew about Reblaza 20 years in Siberia saying that. I don't think she did. No, you could ask her. Everyone should read that. It's so, my husband read it too. <clears throat> yes. Wow. And it's really, it's really another world of um, of elevation. I think to read, to read. So this is an inspiration when we hear stories like this. I read. don't, I don't know this book. So if you want to, uh, I'm going to just uh, show give me you. the title you can, or I, something. You know, oh, the boat. The boat. You can yes. get it on Amazon now. It was for many yes. years. It was out of print. Yeah. Yeah, I got. I had to pay seventy two dollars. It was out of print, and I got. But now I think you can get. It's yeah. S What's it called? Sabota. I mean Shabbos. S O B O T A. Two okay. No. Oh, two. I, I, think, so. I think so. I'm not sure. Sabota with two B's. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was his nickname in the camps in the Gulag because he because he kept he insisted on keeping Shabbos where all the prisoners had to work you know every day of their life for years. He took one day off, but it didn't come easy because they would put him, you know, he tells a story, you know, and at first they tried torturing him because of it. And, but he, he over, he overcame and they just accepted that that's what he does. He doesn't, he doesn't violate Shabbat. He doesn't work on Shabbat. And later on, he was given a job in, um, in accounting. So he had an easier, wasn't actually slave labor. Some all the years he was doing accounting for many years. I think it's his, I think his uh, author name, I think he went by Abraham something. I can't. Abraham Natsach, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, there also, he, he, when he wrote the book, there were still people in Russia that were um, still behind the Iron Curtain. They weren't allowed out in those days from Russia, and they were still followed, and there's still KGB and this and that. So they, they have told him to also write it, not in his own personal name, but to write it in a, another name. To not harm the the when 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 the Hasidim came out of Russia, they were very very careful not to um, give over information and show necessarily so much connection to the Hasidim that were behind the Iron Curtain, because they were they didn't want to get them in trouble. Mm. Yeah, to a point where I think I told you that Reblaza for many years didn't make himself known. Right, he didn't publicly speak as as about the or as. Uh, Right, he, he he printed the book a different name. Never came out and said, "This is my book," and I'm now a speaker. When I, I had read the book when I was in high school, when I met him, I had no idea that was him. Oh was wow! For a few months before he told me even. So wow. yeah, and then later on, when he came out to visit me in LA, and I I printed flyers that said Sabota on it, and he's coming to speak. Um, he was shocked because. He didn't tell me I'm not supposed to do that. So I didn't realize I shouldn't do that. I just printed a flyer. I mean, because for me, I knew, you know, it was very clear. I knew who he was. He was my teacher. It was about that. And I didn't, I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to print a flyer. So when he came to California and I printed a flyer, he was like, how could you do that? Um, and, and I said, well, I got the Rebbe's Bracha because it was one of those flyers that I had faxed in and got a fax back to, with the Bracha. So he was shocked. 
he was like, he, he, was, he, was, he was shocked because he had many times asked the Rebbe if he could speak and the Rebbe told him no. But this was already 1990 and things were already changing in Russia. And even though we didn't know about it yet. And the Rebbe said, it's okay for him to speak. And then, um, yeah, I got the bracha and he spoke and it was like, he was completely shocked. <laughs> At the point where when he passed by the Rebbe on the way, he stopped in, in, in Crown Heights and he asked the Rebbe for a bracha for speaking. I think this was in 1992 when he was speaking for my dinner. I made a an, like an inaugural dinner for Beis Chana. And that, that he was also, he was still not sure, even though I had gotten a bracha for it, he was still not sure if it was okay for him to speak. He actually asked the Rebbe again for a personal bracha. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he went up to the Rebbe and the Rebbe said, yeah, I gave him a bracha for speaking. And for our 1992, it was a banquet, our first inaugural banquet of Beis Chana. And Rebbe, uh, the, the first emissary to California was there, and Beryl Weiss was there, and many of the old timers, the Holocaust survivors, who are founders of the Jewish community of LA, were there. I have very special pictures, this very special um, occasion, the Blazer in LA. And the Blazer and Rabbi Reichik, the, the first Rabbi Reichik, the grandfather of the Rabbi Reichik, who's there of now, he was there at the banquet. He was friends with Reblazer from before. Like he knew him from, they had been together in 770 appointed by the Rebbe to test the Bachrim. They were sent on certain missions by the Rebbe. But the, to, to test the Bachrim in 770 was a whole nother story. Maybe I'll tell you another time because it's already a quarter to nine. So remind me, it's not related to this, but I'll tell you some more Reblazer stories. He should have an Elias and Hashama. His yard site is the 13th of Adar, which is Er Purim, which is the day that the Jews overcame their enemies. In the Purim story, in the story of the Megillah, that's his yard site. And his um, father was Mordechai. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's the, the connections of how do we get there? I don't know. One, one thing to the next to the next. <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you ladies for joining. Let's do the psukim and take the kaychas of holiness, of emunam bitachon, of connection to Hashem in the darkest moments of this gullus transformed into geula. Okay, Torah tzibalanu moshe marasha kihilas yakov shmai sal adonai eloheinu adonai echad. Yisrael <laughs> Ladies, have a wonderful good Shabbos. Shabbos of Geula. We should hear good news today. And anybody want to say something or before we turn off the, the computer? Good Shabbos.